Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 essential piano quintets for beginners. And with all these essential lists, I ask you kindly, do not add or subtract from this list. It's for beginners. It's good enough to have 10 of them. That's a project, just listening to those. And you're going to really enjoy doing that. But take your time, go through them gradually. There's a world of color and expressive musical intensity in these works. Really, they're extraordinary. And we begin. We begin where chamber music always begins. Mozart, that is chamber music from the classical period. It's Mozart if it's not a string quartet. It's Haydn if it is a string quartet. It's really very simple. Mozart wrote amazing chamber music for every conceivable combination, including string quartets, which are remarkable, of course. But this is one of his all-time great, 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 greats, because Mozart was nothing if not a master at the imaginative use of woodwind instruments and the combinations of sonority that they can create. Oh, it's just luscious. And he wrote a quintet for piano and four woodwinds, those being um, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, and a horn. Now, the horn is a brass instrument. It's not technically a woodwind. But the amazing thing about the French horn is that it goes both ways. It's a bisexual instrument. It can do either it can blend with the brass and be very heroic and brassy, or it can make a marvelous counterpoint to the other members of the woodwind section. And that's how horns are used in, in the symphony orchestra generally to do both of those things. Anyway, Mozart's quintet is an extraordinary work. Um, delicious and tuneful and fun and oh my goodness you're going to learn so much about the sound of the instruments and what you can do with them and you know the key when you're writing chamber music with piano generally is this and this is something you should always keep in mind when you listen to these works the piano is a world unto itself right you have two hands ten fingers every one of them can press a key at the same time, so you have a richness of harmony, a fullness of harmony that requires no other assistance to make its point. Whereas all of the wind instruments, and this is also true of string instruments, are basically melody instruments. That is, they play the tune. They play one note at a time. Now, strings can actually play more than one, but that's a special thing. It's kind of a special effect. It's called a double stop. And it doesn't really sound as nice, quite frankly, as when the instrument is playing the melody. So, so you've got a, a full mass of harmony in the keyboard, and then you've got an assortment of instruments, each of which is a melodist. And so in order to play harmony, they have to work together. Each one has to get a note in the harmony. And so they have to be written for in a way such as to counterbalance the natural dominance of the piano, of the keyboard. And how composers do that is what chamber music for piano and ensemble, whatever that ensemble is, is all about. And when you have wind instruments, particularly because each one of them is different, it's not like a body of strings where they're all from the same family and, and make sounds in the same way. These are all different personalities, but you have to combine them in ways that effectively cooperate with and, and oppose, when necessary, as a unit, the piano. And there are a million different combinations of colors that you can make with these four instruments in combination or in opposition to the keyboard. And that's what Mozart does. And my God, it's fun to listen to. And Mozart's piano quintet with woodwinds was so amazing that Beethoven copied it. He copied it by writing his own in the same key, which is our number two selection here. And it's wonderful to compare them. In Mozart's quintet, the oboe is the lead wind instrument. In Beethoven's, it's the clarinet. So already the sound is quite different. Um, many people are, you know, there's a natural assumption that Beethoven was always like superior because he came later and because he was Beethoven, you know. But a lot of people have argued, and I agree with them, that the Mozart is the greater work of the two, just in terms of the way the instruments function together, the, the happy combinations he achieves. But you may disagree. The Beethoven is fabulous. 
It's an early, enthusiastic Beethoven thing with lots of good tunes and full of uh, the pianistic bravura that was not available to Mozart because, first of all, he didn't have the instruments, and second of all, the technique hadn't evolved quite to the point where it did when Beethoven popped up. So compare them and listen to them. They usually come on the same discs if you're buying physical product. They're always disc mates because it's natural to couple them both. And you can hear both what mature Mozart did, what Beethoven learned from him, and maybe a little bit of what Beethoven didn't learn from him. Um, this is all up to you to just listen and get to know the works. And when you do, you'll draw your own conclusions. And they are neither right nor wrong. They are just yours. So that's the first two. Next, Schubert, another master of the classical period, but also transitional to the Romantic period. Romantic meaning passion and, 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 and sort of a looser formal desire to, put, to place emotion over formal tautness and things like that. But, you know, it depends on the composer, doesn't it? This is his Trout Quintet. I mean, it's quintet for piano and strings and some key. and the, It's the Trout Quintet. Everyone calls it that. Why is it called the Trout Quintet? Because one of the movements, and there are five, it's a long work. Um, one of the movements is a set of variations on his tune, the Trout. It's about a trout. It's a very good tune. It's a lot of fun. Um, and it also includes a double bass in the string section. So it's string quartet, piano, and double bass. And the double bass is a very interesting addition to chamber music. It's rare. Dvorak also wrote a double bass string quintet, actually. I don't think it was a piano quintet. Yes, string quintet. Um, they, they don't pop up in chamber music very often. Double basses do because it exists on a totally separate plane of tone from the rest of the string instruments. I mean, it's not even a member of the violin family, as violins, violas, and cellos are. It's a member of the viol family, a different, a different brand of string instrument. It's the last surviving member of that particular crew. Kind of interesting when you think about it. But when you listen to double basses, they're kind of gruff and wooly, and they do wonderful things to add firmness to the bottom of the ensemble, to the base of the piano, or to the base of the strings because they're an octave below the cellos usually but by the same token they don't work too well when they play solo because double bass solos unless they're very high up on the instrument are, are, are not very audible I mean they just sort of sound woolly and sort of <laughs> down there at the bottom but Schubert's Trout Quintet is, is a gorgeous ensemble they give the whole group an almost orchestral feel because of that the weight on the bottom and the freedom that that gives all of the other players up on top to make harmony and fun accompaniments and do other things. So the trial quintet is like gorgeous and melodic and everyone loves it and it's joyful. And, and it's also because it has five movements, it's, it's, it's more sweet-like. You have a theme of variations, you have a dance, you have, that is, it's, it's not a tautly argued work in the way the Mozart and Beethoven pieces are and so many of the others in this set. It's absolutely lovely. Then we have Schumann's Piano Quintet in E-flat. Now, all the rest of these quintets, I think all the rest of them, it seems to me, yes, are for piano and strings, not woodwinds. So the strings are going to be a string quartet, two violins, a viola, and a cello, unless you have a double bass, as in the Schubert, where you actually, I was wrong. I said it was a string quartet with a double bass. It's not. It's a violin, a viola, a cello, and a double bass. There you go. But it's close enough. Four strings plus a piano. That's what we're thinking about. The Schumann Quintet is one of his most popular pieces of chamber music. It's lovely and songful and Schumann-esque. Now, Schumann is a chamber music composer. He wrote, you know, he was, he, Schumann went insane. And some people say that aspects of his insanity are evident in the fact that he focused on certain types of music and wrote tons of it, and then he went on to something else, that he was obsessive. And he was obsessive, no question about that. And so he wrote like a few string quartets and some violin sonatas and some piano quartets and piano quintets and all that stuff. And there some trios. He did like a lot of chamber music at one time. And the piano quintet is one of those pieces and it's very, very popular. And you should give it a listen and see what you think of it. I am not going to say that it's the most like thrilling of all the things in this cycle. I find Schumann as a composer problematic. And I know that when you're talking to beginners, as some of you are, you're supposed to say, oh, it's all just wonderful. No, you're not. 
You're supposed to like what you like and not like what you don't like and not worry about what other people say. I'm just pointing you in the direction. I find Schumann problematic not because not because he was a bad composer. He was an amazing composer. He was a genius. But I find his, his, his handling of form somewhat clumsy. And I'm a form guy. And also his handling of melody. His melodies are wonderful melodies, but they tend to fall into sort of self-contained units that don't allow for much development. There's not a lot you can do with them, it seems to me. And so his music can often sound kind of like it stops. It has dead spots, in my view. Others disagree. So I'm just throwing that out there. But I'm not saying don't listen to it or that there's anything wrong with it. You listen to it and you decide, again, whether you think I'm right or wrong. It's up to you. Next, the Brahms Piano Quintet in F minor. Oh, this is juicy. Very juicy. This is one of the hottest of all the Brahms chamber music works. It's dark. It's passionate. It's, it's exciting. It gushes. It has a gorgeous slow movement, a fabulous scherzo sort of dance movement, which isn't a dance at all. Uses the obsessive Beethoven fifth motive. Yeah, Brahms is kind of obsessed with that. He uses it a lot in his first symphony, too. Now, the Brahms piano quintet exists in two versions. There's the version for piano with strings, but it also exists as a piece for uh, two pianos or piano four hands or something like that. It's like lots of pianos. And, and it's, it's, I love that version, the all keyboard version. Um, I think you should listen to both if you can, but the quintet version is the one that's much more popular because there aren't so many great quintets out there. And you can usually find a string quartet and a pianist who are willing to get together for a concert. Whereas two piano recitals or two pianists or piano four hands, those kinds of things, those are, are, are harder, you know, when you have two, two jumbo pianos or, you know, they're, they're, they're just less common than string quartets and solo pianists. But the piano quintet is one of the great romantic masterpieces for the medium. And I'm just telling you there that you can get it in two different flavors, chocolate and vanilla two different versions and uh, compare them if you feel like it. It's kind of fun to do. It really is because they sound quite different. I mean, it's the same music, but the colors, the textures, the balances, they're all, it's, it's rather a different thing when you hear everything on the same plane of tone just for keyboards. And then when you have an ensemble that has to contrast and oppose the piano and blend with it and do things like that. Totally different conception. Amazing. Next, the Spanish composer Joaquin Torina. Torina is a really wonderful composer. He wrote mostly piano music. Spanish composers tended to work for the keyboard. They wrote keyboard music and they wrote operas and the zarzuelas, you know, those operettas, Spanish operettas, because Spanish musical culture was based on, you know, those media more than anything else. There were not freestanding symphony orchestras, for example. There were some chamber ensembles, which allowed for the creation of some amazing chamber music. Um, this is a, you know, the late, we're talking late 19th, early 20th century. Spain has grown up since then and has lovely orchestras now and whatnot, and composers writing for them. But Torina wrote a small body of really fine orchestral works, like the Danzas Fantasticas. But he also wrote a gorgeous piano quintet in G minor. It was his Opus One, his very first opus. Usually that means your first published piece, or the first piece that you're willing to acknowledge as yours. I mean, most composers write tons of stuff before and they discard it or throw it away or they save it and people publish it later when they're dead, you know. But this was his first major work. And it's a wonderful piece, a passionate, romantic, fun piece of piano and string chamber music. And it deserves some extra attention. You don't hear his name, Joaquin Turina, as often as you probably should. And if you're a beginner, it's nice just to know that these things exist because you'll hear some of these works, you'll fall in love with these composers, um, and you'll find your own route. You don't have to just go with the big names. They're fabulous works, not by the big names. And you should keep that in mind. Next, Elgar, Edward Elgar, the guy who wrote Pomp and Circumstance, the guy who you can't graduate unless you can hear do, 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 do,
he wasn't as prolific as other major composers. And, you know, he wrote two symphonies and a bunch of choral works and a couple of overtures and symphonic poems and things like that. Um, some beautiful works for string orchestra and a, a tiny body of chamber music. Very, very small group of chamber pieces, mostly at the end of his life. Um, the Piano Quintet is his opus 84, the very end of his life. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Lots of fun to listen to with some amazing tunes. I mean, the first movement has, he, he was sort of in love with Spanish music, actually. And although he doesn't usually say so, some of his melodies have a, a somewhat Spanish cast to them. And you hear that in the second subject of the first movement of this piano quintet, the second big tune. It has a piano going boom, 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 boom. And the strings go, that was just lovely. Really a terrific piece. And again, rather, rather neglected because Elgar isn't all that popular outside of the UK, although I think he's getting more so. And his chamber music, because he only wrote very, very little, very, very few pieces, also doesn't get played. Most of his smaller works, his chamber works, were for like violin and piano. They were for, and they were salon pieces, what they call for playing at home, short little attractive pieces, but not works in large forms. So the piano quintet is one of the major, major statements of his late period after he had almost retired and given up writing big orchestral works. It's terrific. It's absolutely terrific. Next, Shostakovich. Shostakovich, oh, Shostakovich is such a great composer. He's amazing. 20th century Russian, he wrote during the Stalinist period. He's, his music is full of controversy as to what it sneakily, secretly represents because he was always getting in trouble with the regime and whatnot. And he wrote 15 symphonies and 15 string quartets and a select number of other chamber works, including a couple piano trios, the second of which is just a screaming masterpiece, and it's often coupled with this, his piano quintet in G minor. It's his opus 57. So it's sort of a, a vintage work of his maturity. Really, really first class. Shostakovich was one of those composers who is almost schematic in the way he writes for instruments. The piano does the piano thing, the strings do the string thing, and you can hear how he interweaves them because his piano writing isn't thick. It's, it's never full of big, fat chords that, you know, sort of clog up the textures. He keeps everything open and spacious and airy, and he likes to make sure that the string body and the piano balance each other very, very effectively. The piece is full of good tunes, and, 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 and as always with Shostakovich, dark moments, creepy moments, moments of, of, of great passion and sometimes despair. Fabulous piece. And last but not least, the Czech composer. Oh, I missed one. Ah, wait, not last but not least. I skipped before between Brahms and Turina. Let's not forget Dvorak, the greatest chamber music composer in the second half of the 19th century. Bar none. That was Dvorak. He wrote a couple piano quintets. Number two, the in A major, opus 81, also a late work. One of the all-time great piano quintets all-time great pieces of chamber music in any form. It has tunes. Oh my God, does it have tunes. The tunes are so beautiful. Oh my goodness, they're just so beautiful. I mean, I, I can't even begin to describe how gorgeous the whole thing is. Um, and and it, it gets played a lot and recorded a lot. And it's, it's just, it, it will make your heart sing. It really will. Uh, you just are not gonna believe all of the beautiful melody that Dvorak packs into this piece in wonderful formal formal frameworks. It's a big work, a big, juicy, symphonic work. It's like 40 minutes long or something. It's, 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 it's a very serious piece, um, a no BS piece of chamber music. And oh, each instrument just sings its heart out. Yes, how could I skip that? I must have been brain dead. So there you go. Dvorak's Piano Quintet Number 2 in A major. And if you like it, go with Number 1, which is an earlier work. Um, very, very different in character, but also wonderfully mellifluous and tuneful and worth getting to know. Once you're into the chamber music piano quintet mode, you have to get into it. Once you're into it, 
The sky's the limit. Now, there we are. Last but not least, Dvorak's compatriot, Bohuslav Martinu. Now, Martinu is a 20th century composer. He died around 1960-ish, I think, 61, somewhere in there. Uh, and, and he also was interested, as Dvorak was, in absorbing the mellows, the, the, the style of Czech folk music, which is incomparably tuneful and beautiful, into his own particular idiom. But he had a very special mature idiom. And this is, this is a mature work, his piano quintet number two. It's, Martin New has H numbers. He doesn't have opus numbers. He wrote tons of music. And this is H number 298. So there's 298 other Martinusians that came before this particular Martinusian. I mean, this particular work. And it's absolutely fantastic. Now, Martin New's style is characterized by long singing melodies, but with really tricky syncopated rhythms. Syncopated rhythms means the accent falls off the beat. So if you're doing like, if you're in three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, you know, normal waltz tempo with a hard accent on the first beat of the measure on one. Well, with Martin knew the beat may be on three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, or, or on two, one, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, like that. And that makes his music tricky to play and fascinating to listen to because it flows in an unpredictable way. It keeps your ear going. His melody may go da 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 like that. And so that is one of his tunes, by the way. Um it's from his sixth symphony, I think. It's the first one that came to mind. Anyway, it's it's fascinating for that reason. And also his use of harmony. He uses what's called non-functional harmony. What is non-functional harmony? Well, in the tradition of Beethoven and Mozart, the chords that accompany the melodies have a very logical progression from one to the other normally. And when something illogical shows up, it's very startling. It has a dramatic purpose. In Martineau, and a lot of later music, a lot of 20th century music that is not atonal, that uses traditional harmony, those chords are no longer goal-directed the way they are in classical harmony. They don't push to resolve in a home key or something. You find beautiful chords that are savored for themselves, just for their own beauty that lead to another one that's not, not logically related. You don't feel that there's a sense that one thing had to move to the other. They're all surprising or, or somehow designed to be savored for themselves. Debussy was the first great master of that style of writing. We call it impressionist. But it, it was much, much more than that. I mean, it was a, a treatment of harmony that was completely new. And Martin New does that. And that makes his, his music really, although it's often, you know, often I, I, I often say it reminds me of a candy cane. That is, it's bright and it's sweet and it has like a nice minty freshness about it. You know, that's really lovely. Even when it's very dark, there's this liveliness about it because of his handling of rhythm and also because of his always startling and fresh use of harmony. And he wrote an absolutely beautiful piano quintet, technically piano quintet number two. I wouldn't worry so much about H298 if I were you. Um, if you really love it, you might want to hear the other 291 that came before or the God knows how many hundred that came afterwards. Um, actually, there aren't that many that came afterwards because it's a late work. But my oh my, what a magnificent addition to the piano quintet repertoire in the composer's own unique style. So there you have it. Ten essential string quintets, piano quintets, pardon me. String quintets is a different talk. I don't think we've done that yet. Oh, it's coming. But by the time, you know, the year 2856 is around, we'll have done string quintets too. But in the meantime, enjoy these piano quintets. They are absolute stunners. Some of the best work that the individual composers did in the chamber music medium. And because there's a piano and a big body of strings, they have, like I said, this big, almost orchestral quality about them. So if you are shying off from chamber music because of the snob factor, which is well, always something in the classical music world, or you find that maybe small ensembles don't offer you sort of the color or the power that you're used to in big symphonic works, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised at the completeness the fullness that these pieces provide and uh, the richness of expression. I think it's really quite remarkable. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you for joining me and take care.